Welcome to Royal City Community Church. We're so glad that you could join us today again. We are going to be continuing our Bible study in the book of Hebrews. Uh, last week we were in Hebrews chapter 1. We were looking through the last few verses, I think it was verses 4 through 14. Uh, we were talking about the fact that Jesus Christ is superior to angels. And there was five different points that we were going to look at in that. We got through the first one. Uh, we found that he was superior to angels because of the title. And we found out that he had a more excellent name. Uh, of course, that name was the Son, which was ascribed to him through not only the virgin birth, but also through the resurrection. So that brings us to point number two. And as we get into that this morning, let's just open up with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you. God, we thank you again for this opportunity to be found in your presence and Lord God, as we delve into your word, as we uh, continue in this book of Hebrews, Father God, Lord, we thank you for what you want to reveal to each heart, to each life. And Father God, as we discuss Jesus' superiority to angels, Father God, Lord, we, there's just so much we can learn and glean from this as well, Father God. So Lord, I just pray that you just open up our hearts to receive from you today, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so the second point is and to show Jesus' superiority to angels, was the fact that he's greater because he's worshipped. All right? And verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, uh, it says, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 6, says, as soon as we can find that, it says, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world. Okay? So, and he says, and then it goes on, it says, let all the angels... Of God worship him okay so Jesus Christ is not only greater than angels because he is God's son but also because he is worshiped even though Christ humbled himself even though he made himself for a time lower than the angels the angels are to worship him and if angels are to worship him he must therefore be greater than they are and if he's greater than they are so that means the covenant that he was bestowing had to show that it was greater than the covenant that they had brought, okay? The new covenant is greater than the old, and Christianity would be there deemed to be greater than Judaism. Uh, now, it says, let all the angels of God worship him is actually a quotation right from Psalm 97, verse 7. And the psalmist here predicted that all the angels were to worship the Lord's Christ. Jews should not have been surprised uh, at the reference that was being made here in the book of Hebrews. The truth is, in fact, the very words actually came from their own scriptures. So far from matching the incarnate Son in glory, angels are commanded to worship him. But you say, well, didn't the angels also always worship Christ? Yes, they worshiped him throughout their time of existence. But prior to his incarnation, they worshipped him as God. This son who, um, who became a man is higher than the angels. Okay, now they're also to worship him as son because he is higher than the angels. Uh, and, you know, and it's, he's the very God that the angels had always worshipped. I mean, it's an absolute sin and violation of the most basic of God's laws to worship anyone else but God. So if God himself said that the angels are to worship the Son, then the Son must be God. That seems obviously to make sense to us there. In his incarnate person, even as his eternal person, Christ is to be worshipped. Now in this passage it calls Christ the firstborn. And now many sects and cults, uh, they, who, they claim a, a proof text right there to show that Jesus is a created being. Well look, he's the firstborn, they say. He was born like the rest of us. A related supposed proof text that they will probably pull out is Colossians 1.15. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. But firstborn has nothing to do with time. Okay? Firstborn here refers to position. It's not a description, but a title, meaning the chief one. The concept was associated with firstborn because the oldest son usually was heir to the father's entire estate. Now the first son to be born was not always the firstborn. We have a reference, of course, I mean Esau, he was 
the oldest, but Jacob was referred to the, as the firstborn. Uh, Genesis 49.3 gives a good description of the firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Okay, so might, strength, dignity, and power, these are all terms that describe the meaning of the firstborn, okay? It, it, is, not a, it is not a time word. I want us to understand that. It is a right to rule word, okay? In, in other words, it's an authority word. Jesus Christ is the supreme firstborn, amen? Uh, he's the supreme uh, right to rule son. These passages, therefore, do not refer to Christ's birth as such, but to his sovereignty. He's also the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 tells us that. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Now, we, of course, we know that there are others that were resurrected before Jesus. We know that Lazarus, of course, was risen from the dead, and other people through Jesus' ministry. Um, all the Old Testament saints who came alive at the crucifixion, all these and others had been raised from the dead before Jesus was raised himself. The term, therefore, obviously does not refer to time. As firstborn, Jesus, he is the most honored one. He is the most dignified one. He is the highest one. He is the most powerful one. Amen. Hallelujah. Of all those who've been resur resurrected, he is far and above the greatest. Amen. Now that word again in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6, that has caused a few commentators a little bit of difficulty. Uh, and before we can understand again, uh, looking at that one little word, we need to look at another key word in the passage, which is world. Okay? It says, when he brings again the firstborn into the world, and he says, let all the angels of God worship him. The, co the more common Greek word for word here is cosmos, meaning the universe. But that's not being used in this translation here. It's rather another, another word, which I, I, I can try to pronounce it. O -I, well, I won't even, I'll spell it. O-I-K-U-O-U-M-E-N-E, -E, which means the inhabited earth. Christ was not the first one, of course, to be born um, in the earth, but is the firstborn, the chief one, the most honored one, who came to an already inhabited earth, where millions had already been, of course, born before he was. Uh, the word order of the King James, and again, when he bringeth in the, the begotten, the first begotten of the world, into the world, has added to the confusion in interpreting verse 6. As reflected in most modern translations, the Greek word order is, and when he again brings. So verse 6, again, refers to God bringing his firstborn into the world at another time. Well, when it is this, again, quotations, going to happen? Well, of course, the only possible answer is at his second coming. God has already brought him once as son, and he's going to bring him again as son in blazing glory. Amen. Hallelujah. It's only at the second coming that the fullness of the prophecy and let all the angels of God worship him will come to pass. See, at the present time, angels didn't understand the whole picture well enough to give the son full worship. The Old Testament prophets had similar difficulty understanding the full meaning of what it exactly was that they'd written. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but in many cases did not fully understand the messages that they were given, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. That's 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 11. And in the next verse, 1 Peter 1, verse 12, it explains that it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Amen. So they were looking to see the things that would not be understood until Christ came. The gospel was preached and the Holy Spirit was manifested. In fact, these mysteries to which the angels still long to look they, they don't understand it all yet, okay? Um, perhaps the presence angels around the throne do, okay? But the vast angelic hosts evidently are not yet able to discern everything. Angels have remarkable intelligence. We've discussed that before, but they're not omniscient, okay? They're not all-knowing. When God again brings his firstborn into the world, he will say to them, in effect, now, you have the full picture, okay? 
and your worship can be full and complete. In fact, we see that in Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. You can mark those verses down. It says, And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Amen. So right here we have what's the, the angelic worship. The, the, you know, Christ is getting ready to come again. He's coming ready to, getting ready to take the world unto himself. Uh, and, and in uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, the Father's pictured uh, with the title deed to the earth. I, I'm talking about that little scroll. And those around the throne are saying, who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is worthy to, to break the seals? And suddenly one of the elders says, you know, stop weeping. Because John says there's nobody was worthy. And, and, and one of them says, stop, weep, stop weeping. Behold, the lion is from the tribe of Judah. The root of David has overcome. So as to open the book and its seven seals. Jesus Christ, the Lamb, he then takes the scroll. And as he's about to unscroll the judgments and take possession of the earth, the angels say, hey, it's all clear now. And countless millions of them, it says myriads upon myriads of them from all over heaven, they burst forth into praise, joined by all the other creatures of the universe. You look at verses 13 and 14, and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and of the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped him. Okay, that right there, of course, it speaks of his second coming, where he will be revealed in his full glorious son, the firstborn. The angels finally will see it all then, okay, as they see him come as king of kings and lord of lords. That brings us to number three. Christ is greater because of, of his superior nature. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7. And, so, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, now Jesus, of course, he's also superior to the angels because of his nature. Verse 7, the Holy Spirit shows the basic difference between the nature of angels and the nature of the Son. And the Greek word for makes, uh, poeo, if I'm pronouncing that right, it means to create or to make. Since Christ created the angels, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 tells us that, he is obviously superior to them. That goes without obviously saying. Not only were they created by him, but they are his possession. They are his angels, okay? They are his created servants. They are his ministers. They are his winds. They are his flames of fire. And that goes on in verse 8, the first part of it says, But of the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That first part of verse 8 expands on the difference between God's nature, sorry, Christ's nature, and that of angels. Here is one of the most amazing and important statements in all of Scripture. Jesus is God eternal. We need to catch that. Jesus is God eternal. Those who say Jesus was just a man, or he was just uh, one of many angels, or one of many prophets of God, or was but like maybe just a sub-God, okay? I mean... You're, they're lying and they're bringing upon themselves the, the anathema, which of course is, refers to the curse of God. Jesus is no less than God. The Father says to the Son, thy throne, O God, is, is, is forever and ever. God the Father acknowledges God the Son. And I believe this verse gives the clearest, most powerful, emphatic, and irrefutable proof of the deity of Christ in the Bible. Right from the Father himself. Now, Jesus, he has his own claim to deity. Um, we know the Father's testimony about the Son corresponds to the Son's testimony about himself. Throughout his ministry, Jesus claimed equality with God. Uh, for this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. John chapter 5 and verse 18. When he said, I and the Father are one, John chapter 10 and verse 30, the Jewish leaders, they understood directly and totally exactly what his claim was there. And in light of who they thought he was, 
A mere man. That's who they all that they thought Jesus was. This is a mere man. He's claiming that he's God, that he's equal to God. No, I mean, the reaction was to be expected. For a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. That's John chapter 10, verse 33. Of course, not only did Jesus have that claim to deity, the apostles claim, uh, had a claim on Jesus' deity as well. You know, talking about Israel and their blessings. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9 and verse 5, uh, Whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Now the Greek text more accurately reads, God who is over all, blessed forever. The claim is that Jesus Christ is God. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, the same. Paul writes, and by common confession, Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And he goes on in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 and says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, in John, in his first letter, he says, we know that the Son of God has come. This is 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we might know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Amen? Okay, so throughout the New Testament, the claim is unequivocal. If I said that word with faith, Jesus Christ is God. Amen? Now in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, we continue to read, it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Okay, so Jesus Christ has an eternal throne from which he rules eternally as God and his king. He is the eternal king with an eternal kingdom. And, and he has an eternal scepter of righteousness. We go on to verse 9. Verse 9, it says... You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now, that verse right there reveals to us Jesus' actions and also his motives. He not only acted in righteousness, he loved righteousness. I mean, how often do we, how often do, we do what we know as God's will, but, we, but sometimes we do it without joy? Uh, in unwilling condescension. Jesus, however, it says he loved righteousness. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. That's James chapter 1, verse 17. Right there, that's true righteousness. It never varies from what is true. It never varies from what is just and what is good. And this is the message that we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. God doesn't vary. Amen. I, I mean, that's a good place to shout amen. God does not vary. Okay? His motives, his actions, his character never varies. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. Amen. Hallelujah. He is total light. He's total righteousness. Uh, displayed in everything Jesus did was his love for righteousness. Even more than the psalmist could say, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119 and verse 97. Now, because Christ loves righteousness, he hates lawlessness. If you love God's right standards, you will hate wrong standards. Very simple. Uh, these two convictions are inseparable. Okay? You can't I, one cannot exist without the other. You can, cannot truthfully say, I love righteousness, but I also like sin. You, you, you can't do that. When there's true love for God, there will be a total love for righteousness and total hatred for sin. See, Jesus hated sin just as surely as he loved righteousness. You know, and, and you see that in his temptation. You see it in his cleansing of the temple. You see it in his death on the cross. And the more we become conformed to our Lord, come on, the more that we're going to find that we too love righteousness and hate sin. By our attitudes towards righteousness 
And, and, and our attitudes towards sin, we can tell how close we are to being conformed to Christ. Hebrews 1.9 is the most direct statement of Jesus' superiority to angels. Therefore, God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. Okay? Now, some commentators believe companions refers to men. But angels, not men, are being discussed in this passage, as we have made very clear. The Greek word simply uh, connotes, connotes, I don't know if that's the right word or not, connotates, I'll get it out, there you go. My pronunciation there was horrible. Connotates an association, nothing more. The point being made here is that Jesus Christ is greater than angels, who are his associates, his heavenly companions, but they're only messengers of God. Christ, too, he's a messenger of God, but much more than a messenger, and therefore much greater than they are. He's exalted. He's anointed above all others. You know, when Paul, when he was speaking in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and he was talking about how, sorry, pardon me, Peter, Peter, when he was at Cornelius' home, he tells of God's anointing Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. God had anointed him and ordained him. Psalm 2, verse 2, another place of the Old Testament, anticipate this anointing. You know, the, the word Messiah, you know, we call Jesus the Messiah. Messiah is a transliteration of the Hebrew word for anointed one. Christ is a transliteration of the Greek word meaning the same thing. In other words, Jesus' supreme title, Messiah or Christ, means the anointed one. Jesus was God's anointed, amen? When did that happen? I believe that Jesus was, was officially anointed as king when he went to heaven after his resurrection. At that time, the Father exalted him and gave him a name above every other name. First, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. He assumed his kingship at his ascension. Although he has not yet brought all his kingdom together, someday soon he will. So Jesus' nature, talking again about his deity, like his title and his being worshipped, show his superior to angels. Brings us to number four. Uh, greater because of superior existence. Let's read verses 10 through 12. Uh, 10 through 12. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and all the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Okay, so the fourth way in which Jesus is superior to angels is in his existence. Okay? He has the superior existence. And this quotation from Psalm 102, the Holy Spirit reveals that Christ is better than angels because he exists eternally. If Jesus was there, if Jesus was in the beginning to create, he must have been, he must have existed before the beginning and therefore be without beginning. Uh, in the beginning was the word. John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that. So just as you would uh, roll up and throw away an old worn out garment, that when you're done with it, Jesus will one day discard the heavens and the earth. One day the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth and all its works will be burned up. 2 Peter chapter two, uh, uh, 3 verses 10, verse 10 tells us that. And the sky was split apart like a scroll. When it is rolled up and every mountain and island are moved out of their places... That's Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. All right, so the things that we can see and feel, they seem so permanent. Like the people that Peter warned, we're tempted to think that it all continues just as it was from the beginning to creation. But all these things are going to perish, and the Lord is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. The creation will be changed, but not the creator. The, thy years will not come to an, an end. Christ is eternal. He is immutable. He never changes. And as I quoted earlier, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 tells us. So, hey, men come and go. Worlds come and go. Stars come and go. Angels were subjected to decay, as the fall proves. But Christ never changes. He is never subject to change, is never subject to alteration. He is eternally the same. He is therefore superior to angels in title, in worship, in nature, in existence. And finally, point number five is what we're going to close with today. He is greater because of superior destiny. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. And it 
it says, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Okay, so here, within only the first chapter, is the seventh Old Testament quotation. That quotation is found from Psalm 110, verse 1. And, and, it, and it reaches the climax of, of the full superiority of Christ to angels. You know, first we see the destiny of Christ, then that of angels. No angel has ever been promised a place at God's right hand. Only the Son will sit at the right hand of God. Uh, the destiny of Jesus Christ is that ultimately everything in the universe is and will be subject to him. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 says, In the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and uh, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Okay? So Christ, Jesus Christ, in God's plan, is destined to be the ruler of the universe and everything that inhabits it. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom of God and Father. When he has abolished all rule and all authority um, and all power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 24, 25, and verse 28. He is subordinate to the Father, but only in relationship of the son the son of a king may be equal to his father in every attribute of his nature though we officially though be officially subject to the father so the eternal son is equally divine though he is officially in subjection and under his feet are placed all the kingdom and powers and authorities of the world well when does that happen of course we know it happens at his second coming when he comes in glory Revelations 19, verses 15 through 16, gives a vivid picture of, of his next coming. It says, and, when his and from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he might smite the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he's written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, the destiny of Jesus Christ is, is eternal reign over the new heavens and the new earth. Now notice the destiny of God's angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of all those who still, who still sorry, who will inherit salvation? The Jesus' destiny is to reign. The angels' destiny is to serve forever those who are heirs of salvation. I mean, what a, what a wonderful, awesome prospect for us as Christians. In addition to be, being forever in God's presence, our destiny is to be served by the angels forever. You know, I think of a scripture in verse um, 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verses 15 through 17. You can write that down. It's when uh, the Syrians had sent uh, the army to come and get Elisha. And you remember the story? The servant opened up the door and saw, you know, the vast army. And he came back and he said, you know what? Hey, what are we going to do? This army is coming to get us. This army from Syria, they've come to get us. And, and Elijah said to him, pardon me, Elisha said to him, do not fear for those that are with us are more than are with them. And Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And what did he see? Behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around them, outnumbering the Syrian army. Hallelujah. Who were riding the horses and chariots? Angels. Angels protect and deliver the believer from temporal danger. Angels, they rescued Lot and his family, snatching them out of Sodom. Angels got into that den with Daniel and stopped the lion's mouth. I mean, what a, what a marvelous, comforting truth to realize that angels minister to us. Their destiny is to continue to minister to us throughout eternity. But Jesus' destiny... It's to reign, hallelujah. He is therefore immeasurably, immeasurably superior to angels. So we find that the Son of God is superior to angels in every way. And with each of these superiorities having been described in the Old Testament, we, we see Jesus is Messiah. He's God in the flesh. He is the mediator of a new covenant, a covenant that was far superior and better than the old. 
And in these 14, uh, in, in this 14 verse chapter, chapter one of Hebrews, and we're finishing off that today, obviously, we see the deity of Jesus Christ established by divine names. He's called son, he's called Lord, he's called God. By divine works, he creates and sustains and governs and redeems and purges sin. By divine worth, he is the one to be worshiped by the angels and all other creatures in the universe. By divine attributes, he is omniscient. He is omnipotent, he's unchanging, and he's eternal. In all these ways, the superiority of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed. And why are these truths so important? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because the next passage, as we go into chapter 2, and we're going to start looking at the hopefully the next four uh, verses of chapter 2 next week. Chapter 2 gives us the answer. It says, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For if the words spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. See, if God expected such a positive response to the law, which came through the angels, what, what response does he expect concerning the gospel, which came through Jesus Christ? Amen. That's where I'm going to leave it today. I trust that you learned something from that today. Praise God. Just talking about the superiority of Jesus Christ to the angels. Thank you for being here today. God bless you, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Amen.